Today's guest for this Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama live lockdown lowdown is renowned for her long and extensive career in both classical and pop music recording. Films, television series, including her amazing list of over 1,000 film soundtracks to date. Her credits include four Harry Potter films, the Disney musicals such as Into the Woods, Beauty and the Beast, Mary Poppins Returns and Aladdin, all of the James Bond films since the John Barry days, and all of the Avengers films. Her album and concert credits include artists such as Elton John, Paul McCartney, Sting, Robbie Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, Michel Legrand, Henry Mancini, John Williams, Pat Metheny, Frank Sinatra, Joan Sutherland, Pavarotti, Domingo, James Galway, and many, many more. Skylar Kanger studied piano and singing from an early age at the Royal Academy of Music and at 17 started the harp, and she quickly became established freelancing with all the major London and regional orchestras. For 25 years, Skylar was the solo harpist of the famous chamber group, the Nash Ensemble, and since 1971 was the principal harpist of Academy of St. Martin in the Fields under Sir Neville Mariner, and principal harpist of the London Mozart Players from 1993 to 2019. For over 20 years, she and Tommy Riley, virtuoso harmonica player, performed, wrote and recorded many new works for their unique duo, and her solo recordings are available on Naxos, Shandos, ASV and Hyperion labels. Skylar began teaching at the Royal Academy of Music in 1988, and in 2004 was awarded the title of Professor of the University of London. She was head of harp from 1999 to 2010, her former students are globally renowned and many have solo orchestral positions worldwide. She was appointed Professor Emerita of Harp in 2010. In 1993, she established the Academy Harp Ensemble and has commissioned over 25 works for her harp department. Skylar is regularly invited to sit on juries and in July 2019 was president of the jury of the USA International Harp Competition in Bloomington, Indiana. She's given lecture recitals and masterclasses in Russia, across Europe, Hong Kong and extensively in America. Parallel to her extraordinary performing and teaching career skills, Skylar has composed and arranged 22 books of harp music for all levels, many of which are on the ABRSM, Guildhall and Trinity exam syllabi. Her articles have appeared in Gramophone, BBC Music Magazine, together with other publications, and she was honoured to be featured in the Musicians' Union Magazine Hall of Fame article in 2010. Skylar, uh, that's an incredible biography there. Thank you for sitting through it. I hope I didn't cause you to blush too much. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fine. Uh, we're so grateful for you giving up your time and joining us on this very, very hot day. Uh, thank you for being here. The purpose of this afternoon is to give our students the opportunity to speak to you, especially uh, at the end of what's been quite a challenging term for, well, for the whole world, really, because of the uh, coronavirus crisis. But I'd like to start with uh, a question, if I may, and that's uh, you came from a, a musical family. And I'm interested uh, in how you caught the bug to go into music yourself. Well... My father was a violinist um, and I, I was born in India, in Mumbai, and he was a concert solo violinist um, as well as being an engineer in Bombay and he used to do a lot of broadcasts and, and play uh, performances. And, um, and when I was two years old, he, um, he, he won a scholarship to the Paris Conservatoire and uh, went off for two years to study there. And after he'd got his premier prix, he, he auditioned for the London Philharmonic Orchestra. This is in 1950. And, um, and then sent for my mother and myself. Uh, I was four at the time. And uh, we came to London by boat, basically, and uh, brought all the furniture and all the piano and everything with us. And so basically I was immersed in music from a very, very early age. I used to sort of improvise at the piano because I was too lazy to read. <laughs> and and uh, I had piano lessons and, um, and I auditioned for the Royal Academy of Music when I was 11. And I won a place on Saturday mornings um, studying piano and, and also second study singing. And um, 
I was doing my A levels and I, I actually toyed between doing history at university because I loved that or music. And at the time, um, it was a very difficult decision to make for a woman because um, it, in those days it was completely meant a man's world. And uh, I used to go to all the concerts um, when, when he was in the orchestra, uh, later the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra as well. And, um, and the only woman there in the orchestra was the harpist. So I literally thought, okay, I'm going, I'm going to start the, the harp. So that's why at 17 years old, um, I thought, okay, I'm going to start this because I love teaching, but I, I hadn't got that as an ambition. I thought I'll give this a go and see if I get somewhere with it. And um, and when I was 20 years old, in the middle of my middle of my academy training as a pianist, um, I got offered a job on the harp uh, with the Royal Ballet Touring Orchestra in the middle of the summer holidays. And um, they, I did six weeks of that and they said, well, can you do the next six months? So I thought, you know what, I'm going to try. <laughs> so I just, I just left. And, so, um, and that's, that's how I started in music. So you started playing the harp, which is the harp you've made this extraordinary career with at the age of 17. And what, by the age of 19, you were working professionally? 20. I was 20. My goodness. I got how, how, how did you make that transition from, uh, obviously you were a pianist, so an understanding of, uh, uh, you know, an advanced understanding of, of music, but going from piano to harp, such, such different worlds in many ways. What, was, did it just feel like coming home? No, not, not at all. In fact, um, if I look at some music now, I'll be playing it like as if I'm on a keyboard straight away before I go like this, I'll be going like this. <laughs> and so it was just a matter of um, uh, really catching up uh, very quickly uh, with the, the huge gap in my technique because, you know, um, it's a lot of stuff is opposite on the, on the harp to the piano, you know, and the, and the feet and the pedaling, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, you, to get your, your mind um, beyond just looking at a flat and pushing a pedal up rather than down. <laughs> so it took a while for me to actually adjust that the brain messages and also you know um you know the finger technique but i had a wonderful teacher and carol will know of this lovely lady um and that was tina bonifacio and she was um the harpist in the royal philharmonic orchestra um at the time i started and i went to her for a, for a two or three years and um and uh she 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 learned she learned with a marvelous uh pedagogue of the harp, Henriette Grenier, at the beginning of the 1900s. So I had a wonderful teacher there, but it was a, it was a very difficult situation to catch up because I had no harp student life, only piano student life. Yeah, that must have been a, 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 a huge culture change. And also to make the decision to leave full-time conservatoire training in order to, to pursue a, that was a brave choice. Yes, well, the thing is, at that time, things were very different in conservatoires to what they are now, hugely different, like another galaxy almost. Uh, because then, um, all we had as a pianist was a one-to-one -one lesson and um, a bit of choir, actually, and um, any chamber music or bits and pieces or accompanying that you managed to sort of um, team up with your friends, but um, other than that, there was, there was no academic, there was no degree. It was a performing course only. And um, if, you, if you weren't a very good performer, you could opt for a sort of teaching degree, which, which was called the GRSM, you know, Graduate of the Royal Schools of Music. Yeah. But that all sort of changed over the, over the last, uh, obviously, few years. And the academic side of colleges now is uh, incredibly intense. Sometimes I feel too intense and they haven't got enough time to practice, but that's another matter. <laughs> but, I'm not going to say anything about that. Just... No, no. But, um, <laughs> it's a balance, let's face it. But then yeah. it, was not a, it was not that much of an issue. So uh, the choice was sort of, okay, um, I was going into a world where in those days, and we're talking about now 1966, we're talking about, 
Um, there was such a ton of work out there. It was so full that there were myriads of opportunities for people to really, um, you know, try a few things. Uh, hundreds of shows, lots of chamber orchestras, the big orchestras, chamber music groups, sessions, television, broadcasts, you know. So it was it was quite a it was quite a, a, a welcoming sort of thing. A bit daunting, but welcoming. Yeah. I think hearing that this year is is possibly a little bit difficult for, for some because of course one of the things that we're all grappling with at the moment is how we're gonna come out of this pandemic, how we're going to be able to to find those work opportunities and, and just to get back to making music uh, together. Um, I think, yes, I think that in, in over the years, um, we've seen such a lot of um, struggle for the arts to survive in various different ways. I'm not saying we've experienced anything like this pandemic and the whole place shuts down, but uh, lack of funding, cuts to everything um, and um, difficulties of venues. So, so and I, I remember a long time ago when one particular orchestra, I won't mention them, um, was so desperate in financial state uh, situation that many of them were taking jobs as taxi drivers and waiters and considering that, you know, and somehow they got the most amazing manager who managed to somehow market them differently and turn them around. But it was a, it was a close call and it was hard. Mm. But this time it's global. So, um, so the, the, the resourcefulness that we all have to have now going ahead has got to be quite, quite different. And you've got to use every part of your imagination and rather think, positive rather than think oh no yeah think oh yes now what can i do <laughs> and what can, uh, you know with the technology as it is now which of course you know us older than me i'm speaking for myself i find it quite difficult to um to uh, you know manage more than a, a sort of basic modicum of of stuff well but, i mean that technology has allowed us to have this time with you and, and the, this whole series that we've been doing with these lockdown lowdowns. So there are definitely things that we can learn from this time and, 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 and feel optimistic about. I could talk to you all day, but uh, it's the guys who are in the room that I, I really keep for you to meet. So uh, Noah, can I ask Noah Davis to speak to you? Noah is a, a second year harp student. Right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for upcoming session musicians or like aspiring session musicians? You were telling us about the difference between the scene then compared to the scene now. Yes, well, um, as I say, there were myriads of, of, of studios in London, about 36 to 50 um, big ones and small ones and all sorts of projects. Uh, now we are left with two major studios, Abbey Road and Air Studios and um, one or two smaller ones, um, which do more sort of the pop side of things. So the whole scenario has narrowed down to, um, to these, and I'm only talking about London, of course. Um, I don't know, in Wales, I'm sure there, there must be some smaller recording studios and stuff like that. Um, so my, my advice uh, as for a harpist is actually to be able to be a complete musician. So that that means that you can sight read anything. You can play with one headphone on your hip ear and um, look at the music, uh, follow a, a click track, which is now absolutely normal. Um, and, and basically um, be prepared to play most of your life in an isolation booth completely separate from everybody now this is this is a very different way of life from being in an orchestra and playing at the back of the violins or even you know um, an event or whatever it is your normal ensemble scenario is completely out of it now you're hardly ever allowed to go in the room because they want separation so I think my advice to harp players is to 
really be able to um, complete all those skills, um, have a fantastic ear for tuning, a marvellous sense of rhythm, an, a, an unbelievable uh, ability to sight read, and also to rearrange anything that you look at and is instantly unplayable. Because let's face it, not everybody, to put it mildly, knows how to write for the harp. So I hope that's answered your question. That's been great. Is that okay, Noah? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Skylar. Yeah, that, that experience of the, of the booth that you describe and, and, and the click track and the, I mean, there's so much I could, I'd love to pick up on a little bit more from, from what the answer you've just given, the illegible and unplayable harp parts um, that need to be so in the moment and prepared to be adaptable. Um, how much ownership do you take of over those those changes you have to make in order to make? Uh, do you have to go and discuss that with the composer or the arranger or the conductor, or is it literally the red light is on, go? Well, it, the red light is on, but usually now because of email, we can get a heads up of some of the parts, um, say a day before. So um, um, I often sort of print out the difficult bits and look at them. And for instance, if there's two harps on, um, if someone's written a lot of chromatic stuff, I will instantly um, text my second harp and say, bars, bar, bars, this, and that, play the first harp part from here because I'll, she will have got the email as well. So we do our bit of arranging as much as we can um, from the parts we've got in front of us um, before we start, if we've, got the, if we've got the parts. Some of them have not been written yet. So, um, so as you're doing the film, the, the copyist comes in and, and throws a part on the floor. And so often, very, very often, I've been trying to play one cue whilst marking up the pedals and looking at another one that might turn up that might turn up on the floor, piles of stuff. Depends on the project and how much in advance they've, they've, mm. they've written the music. And, and different orchestrators, for instance, you can get, um, um, I'm just about to do, uh, start a, a film um, uh, this weekend, and I can see from the parts that there's a different orchestrator because one understands the pedaling and another one writes chromatic, chromatic passages, which, you know, we can't do so I'm instantly arranging that but it's not it's the same film it's just that in America they they uh, um, engage a, a whole team of orchestrators to get a project ready so it, it's very variable. I wonder if you could describe to all our students some of whom will have had experience of this already but many won't I'm sure and that's that's getting used to playing on a click track and uh, do you have any advice for that? Well, first of all, you've got to be able to play in unbelievably strict time with a metronome. So, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to suddenly produce variable click tracks of your own. But, um, but the first thing is to be able to play incredibly rhythmically in time to a regular click. And then, of course, you know, it's practice. It's just a matter of doing it. And in the parts, in the heart parts, you, off, you always get all the metronome mark changes. So, you know, every bar can be a different metronome mark. So when you're looking at your parts, not, not only are you pedaling it, but you're marking up where to go faster and slower with little arrows and stuff like that. So you've got to be reading the tempo map as the same time as the notes. So it's, it's really uh, multitasking in a yeah. big way. And it's being in the moment, but also the level of preparation that you clearly do and making sure you allow enough time in your, in your busy schedule to say, well, that day I am only looking at the parts for that the following day. You have to squeeze, squeeze it in yeah. because sometimes we don't get a break. No. <laughs> so no. I'll do it in the lunch hour or in the break, you know, so it depends really. Um, can I bring in Keris Reese now, please? Uh, Keris is a third year uh, BIMA student. Um, Kelly, it's your question for Skylar, please. Hello. I was just wondering, what's your favourite part or what's the best part about playing on film scores? I think the best aspect of playing on film scores is, first of all, working with the most amazing composers. And some of them that I've been lucky enough to, um, to work with uh, are not only brilliant geniuses, but they become friends. 
So you don't see them from one project to the next project of theirs, because let's face it, you know, films take sometimes a year, two years to complete, and it depends on what that composer's doing. So um, that's always lovely to, to, to be with old friends. But uh, also it's nice to actually see, it sometimes in the cinema or on your television later, how it's all come out. <laughs> and um, sometimes you're, I'm quite surprised at uh, the actual profile of the harp. In, in the film, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I did um, uh, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. And um, that was a, for a, a guy called Jeff Sonelli, composer. And I was in my booth. And you never know what the balance of the harp is going to be when you're playing because you sound loud and they go, they take it away and they mix it all. And, um, and you know, that's the last you ever see of it. So I, I, we started watching this film and I, my jaw dropped because literally every note I played was like, oh, it, oh it's the harp again. Oh, it's the harp again. <laughs> so the person that actually mixes the, 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 the whole music off um, decides how loud or soft we're all going to be. So sometimes, you know, so you've got to be unbelievably accurate and uh, because they could use anything. So I think that's probably the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry. Um, I should have brought in uh, Jemima Small a little bit earlier, but I, I think the, the, the question that Jemima is going to ask is a very specific slant on session playing. So Jemima, can you ask your question, please? Yeah, you sort of already answered it, but how did you get into session music and film music? They're basically the same, but yeah. Well, um, I, I got into it gradually. Uh, because when I very first started, as I said, I was doing symphony work, chamber music, a bit of solo stuff, accompanying choirs. And I got a chance to do a, a one or two sessions in the very beginning amongst a, a lot of other stuff. And then you make um, a, a contact with uh, what's called a fixer or a contractor who is in charge of booking um, for certain composers. And basically they... Um, if they like you, they'll book you, but they'll try you out first, if you know what I mean. And yeah. so it was gradual. Uh, it was not one or the other. You know, my, my life's been a very big mix, a big, huge pot of different, different stuff. And um, I didn't choose, I'll do this or I did that. Oh, no, I just said yes to everything. And that's, that's, and it's hard, <laughs> but that's the only way that you can build up that sort of confidence. So it was great. Cool. Uh, Thank you. One of the things that I'm always full of admiration for, for harpists is the act of tuning. And in a session when you know this is going to be on celluloid forever, um, how much, how much time is allowed for you to make sure that the, the whole instrument is, is well tuned? There's never any time allowed for any personal stuff like that. Um, I get there usually about, um, about an hour before the session and a bit more if I haven't seen the music. If I've seen the music and I've, I've got it prepared, then I don't have to get there so early. But because I'm in a booth, usually, um, I can actually hear myself very well and I, I'll, I'll tune up. But um, the, the, the point is that things change. You know, orchestras are organic. They don't just stick to one sort of um, synthesized A, if you like. <laughs> you know, so uh, you have to have a complete ear open to what's gone out in your harp or what you're playing with outside but basically um we tune to um 440 or 441 if we're in abbey road because the piano is tuned to 441 in abbey road but basically if it's a, a pop track and um also you're playing with a lot of backing tracks uh, you have to be absolutely uh, usually just above 440 and if you're playing with a piano you've got to be in tune with that piano so mm -hmm. so you know it's a constant awareness it comes back to that phrase you used about being the complete musician. It's, it's not just, you know, it's, it, this is no factory. This is 100% concentration, 100% dedication all the way through. And uh, I think that is an incredible lesson for all of these young players, singers. Um, the amount of, 
uh, of just musical excellence that is, is required for you to have a career like, like you've had? You um, have to dig deep. You have to dig deep because um, sometimes the challenges are, are almost impossible. Um, and, um, and, and because you're in a booth usually and other people don't hear you, <laughs> so you know they don't know you're playing quavers and uh, they might be having a wonderful melodic line or something like that and then you ha you have to make sure you fit whatever they whatever they're doing because it's very likely they don't hear you or they haven't turned it turned the harp up in their headphones so yeah on this note of of the type of music that you've written um kevin who you met earlier our head of music performance has a question that he'd like right Skylar, it's just brilliant hearing you speak about this sort of golden era in, in British orchestral music and, you know, that sort of 60s, 70s period was just incredible and uh, my, my teachers sort of spoke with great affection about that time in music. But what I'm, what I'm really interested in is a comment you made about uh, uh, the orchestrator writing chromatically for the harp. And it made me wonder if you think that today's composers and orchestrators generally have a comprehensive understanding of, of the harp. Or do you think that this has gone into decline over time? Well, the whole the whole situation of learning orchestration has changed because um, uh, the, the the original idea of you learning orchestration as a subject on its own with a bit of paper and pencil and knowing all the ranges and writing down stuff uh, is long gone because everybody, all the new composers, young people, compose on Sibelius, so they're sitting at a keyboard, so they're writing they're writing whatever they feel at a keyboard and the computer sort of siphons this out and um for instance i'll give you an instant the computer the computer does not like writing b sharp or e sharp or f flat or anything remotely like that in a key signature it'll just write the natural note so you can be in, you know, six flats and suddenly you'll be going into, a, you know, F natural and it, it, it mixes it up. It just won't uh, stay in a key. So, you know, that's why uh, you have to go through the parts because it doesn't, it doesn't lie naturally on the harp. And also the other thing is that um, it's very easy for the computer to jump between writing in flats and writing in sharks. And of course, we can't do that. So we have to have one or the other. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of sort of sifting out of parts to do because of that, because of this, the writing at a keyboard. So do you have any direct advice for the composers and arrangers who are listening to this session? Is there anything that you'd like to say to them to make the future a little more comfortable for harpists? Yes, I would like to say, first of all, don't ever think of writing a chromatic passage. And secondly, don't write fast repeated notes because every time you put your hand on the same string, the sound stops. <laughs> it's not like an action of the piano that comes back and you can repeat it quickly. It just muffles it. So that's one thing. And the other thing is um, uh, don't swap between flats and sharps. Stay in flats or stay in sharps. But just make sure that the, that the computer doesn't correct, correct it according to the computer. And, and make sure it stays in one, one regime of flats or sharps. That's the first thing. <laughs> it's, I mean, I use Sibelius a lot, and it's, it's a wonderful program, and it's, it's very intuitive. Um, and it's quite simple to change from an, uh, from an E sharp to an F natural. You just press return, just press enter, and it, and it does it. But very often when they're extracting parts, um, then all of those enharmonics can change. Yes. And I think it just takes incredible patience and care to make sure that you've just pressed extract on all your parts. Um, don't just presume that they're going to be as they've been in the full score, you know, to, to go yes. to them. And that takes the, time. The problem is that the heart part's usually the last to be written. So they've got a, a time frame. And they're all fighting for the deadlines of what, you know, the session's coming up, we haven't done it. So nobody really sits through to that degree and corrects stuff. They go, oh, Skylar's on it, she'll sort it out, leave it. And, and you know, that's the problem with it. You know, the more you sort out, the more you have to sort out. Yeah. Um, John Hardy, our head of composition, is, is in the room together with lots of composition students. And he's got a, a point that he'd like to bring up. John, are you there? 
Hi, Skylar. Lovely to see Hi. you. Lovely to hear what you're talking about. Yeah, we do. Just for you to know, Skylar, we do, in composition, teach orchestration. And I completely believe in it as a separate subject. And it's taught all the way through all the undergraduate and postgraduate composition courses. Fantastic. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, persuading people to really think it through, especially when they're working at speed and to do the proofreading, you know what I mean? And double check everything and really think it through. That remains a bit of a battle sometimes. Um, proofreading. I mean, who is kind of given, if you're lucky enough to get a, a properly paid job producing something for players, almost always there's not quite time enough to do it and do it properly. So what do you do? Bring in people to help or do you try and do it all? It, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? It is, because if, you, if you're going to write a classical work, shall we say classical in brackets, or a contemporary work that's going to publish be published, you've got more time space and thought to go through every detail. Mm. Um, for instance, I've worked a lot uh, on, the, on harp music with um, Paul Patterson, who, who used to teach there, and he's, he's absolutely in love with harp, so he's written lots. But I literally sit with him as we go through the first run through, and correct or ask questions about anything that crops up but this is because we've got time yeah mm. and he obviously wants to publish it so it's going to be correct but in films and sessions there's no time like that mm. you know everything we do 60 cues in a day or you know so much music yeah. thick pads of stuff that just fly by and they 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 record everything so, you know, you've got to do your own level of preparation before you can even get a chance mm. to play it well, let alone perfectly the first time. Yep. So that's what the issue is, really. And I'm so happy that you're teaching orchestration because, um, for instance, I get so many parts of mine that are using harmonics from a sample that are way out of range to actually physically do them. <laughs> You know, or or stuff down in the wire strings, harmonics, and you just can't get them. Mm. But if if you've recorded a sample of of a middle range harmonics, then you can adapt it to any any note you happen to play on the piano. So mm. that's that's another issue. But it's the time factor that is the uh, the question about this. Composers take notes, take time, uh, and on uh, we have a composer in the room, uh, Jasper. Yeah. Hi Skylar, I really love the harp and spend a lot of time learning about the harp and when I do parts I go through and specifically do and harmonics and all the pedaling and everything to make sure it's fine. Um, however, like when I've worked with uh, BBC Now say and I'll give the harpist her part and I've done all the pedaling and I've made sure it all works and then when I after the session or whatever I get the part back she would have written in her own pedaling. So my question is, you know, like the pedaling wasn't wrong. She just changed where she would change certain pedals or she'd change it to a flat because it resonated better with the harp. So my question is, you know, should it be down to the uh, the composer to do the pedaling or the harpist? I think it's a matter of time. If you've got time to do it, it helps you learn about it. But everybody is different. And also um, it's very, very important as to the timing of when you change pedals, according to um, how much uh, resonance there is or how much time you've got or how much brain space you need for your fingers. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's not a, um, a right or wrong. Um, so be, ex you know, do continue what you're doing and enable yourself to, to think about the pedaling stuff. But a harpist will always individualise their parts mm -hmm. so that it makes it right for them. And it won't be the same for one person as another. You know, so don't worry about that too much, but just continue on your way to doing it mm -hmm. and, and check that, you, that you've got uh, the, right, the right notation. I, I often get a lot of pedaling mark that's all wrong. Mm -hmm. So I always check it. Because um, I think you can get Sibelius pedal programs that, yeah. that, that do pedal pictures. Yeah. And uh, this could lead into an awful lot of problems if, um, if it picks up the wrong information. So, yes, it's nice to have some sort of help towards it. But um, harpists will always or should always check it. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mared, can I bring you in now, please? 
Mared Pugh Evans. Uh, Mared is a graduating uh, uh, BMO student. Hi, um, my question to you is what advice do you have for harpists who are transitioning um, from higher education into the professional world? Into the professional world? Well, I think the higher education um, years that you have are a sort of transition between um, being at a um, what I call a school situation as to um, stepping into the profession. And that's why postgrad is so important because you're not absolutely um, overcome with academic deadlines and you can have much more time and to make contacts and to do extra outside work and form chamber groups. And it's a gradual process po postgrad. I think it's very, very important because, um, uh, very few people can just jump out of being Mars into the profession. That's never going to work. So you have to build up your contacts slowly. And you, you do that usually through, through masters and postgrad programs. So by the time you leave, you've already got a few things going. I think that's the best thing I can tell you really. So, um, Marid, if you don't mind me saying, so Marid is going to, you're going on to London. Yes. For your postgrad. Is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, do you want to say where you're going, Mared? Uh, I'm coming to the Academy. Fantastic. Well, I shall hope to see you soon. Um, but you see, what we do what, to help you um, at the Academy um, uh, in that transition is we, we have all these, um, what I call, support classes. So you'll get, um, you get someone from um, a contemporary orchestra uh, giving you a whole term's worth of contemporary marking up classes. We've got sight reading classes, uh, we've got jazz classes, we've got technique classes, everything. So basically we try and a lot of orchestral, we have a huge orchestral course and, um, and, uh, and we have a, you know, a special person that just takes harpists through the, the repertoire that they're going to play in the orchestra in the, in the coming months. And so we try to give you a little bit of a taster so that you can cope with different things if you're thrown, thrown into something like that. For instance, uh, over the last few years, we've been providing the harps for, I um, can't remember the name of the opera company now, but um, basically we provi we've provided harps for the whole Wagner ring. <laughs> and virtually all our leading students have, have done all the, all the Wagner operas before they've even left. So if there's a chance that someone needs a spare harpist for an, a, a Wagner ring, we can suggest their names because they've already played it. So things like that, you know. So that's, that's really what it's all about, really. It's not easy, but it's, it's rather challenging. <laughs> so important. We have great relationships with Welsh National Opera and the BBC National Orchestra of Wales and just that vocational purpose of a conservatoire is, is just so important. But I was interested in, in your answer to Mara there about, uh, about being entrepreneurial, about setting up your own groups, creating your own work whilst you're doing your, your masters. Um, that's something that you, that you definitely advise. Definitely. Because, you know, student relationships and groups, uh, uh, you know, huge quartets and stuff start as student, student groups, you know. And so uh, with a harp, you know, you've got a lot more diverse uh, opportunities for different instruments. So everybody's busy. But if you can, if you can get a couple of groups going, I think um, that that's more possible, possible to actually go into a profession and say, OK, I've got this group. I'd like to apply to this festival and that festival, you know. Um, so uh, ready made programs that you've already done, stuff like that. Imagination, Jim, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think it's so, so important. And, that it, and that's part of that transition, isn't it? You've, you know, people have been in full time education since they're three or four and told to do things. And then it, it's, it's really important to release that inner entrepreneur and to to think creatively about the work that you want to be the perform the performer that you want to be and that's clearly what you've done in your career Skylar and I, I'm just interested to could you have imagined when you started out at the academy that you'd be playing on pop records and and all of that back then no no not really but I used to play along on the piano to pop records <laughs> Who's your who are your favourites? 
Oh, I don't say it's too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to bring in uh, uh, Hannah Williams now, who's got a question related to this. Hannah, are you there? There she is. Can you hear me? Hi. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Out of all the incredible artists that you've worked with, um, do you have a favourite recording experience or performance of any one of them and why, if so? Well, um, it's a lovely question. Um, it's difficult to pick one person, but I, I will give you a few of my all-time favourite people. Uh, we used to work a lot for a wonderful composer called Jerry Goldsmith, and we did many, many wonderful films for him. And um, uh, and also um, Hans Zimmer is another one of my oldest friends, and um, we we've, we've uh, worked together since uh, before he rose to fame in America. And uh, and John Williams, when he first came over here um, to do the Harry Potter films, um, that that was an incredible experience. To do. I think I did one and three with him, um, and then. Um, so that that was that really stood out in my mind, and uh, and shall we put it that the parts are not easy; they are they are very challenging. Uh, Danny Elfman is another incredibly imaginative composer, and uh, uh, the, what they ask of the harp, they don't know the limitations, so they just use their imagination, write what they think they hear. And and you have to work, make it work somehow. So um, that's another that's another person. And James Newton Howard, he's another great great genius. Alan Silvestri, I can go on and on basically. <laughs> Who did all the Avengers stuff and you know? So um, it's very hard to say I only like one because I like about a hundred basically. <laughs> um, I think when I'm when I'm thinking of those Harry Potter scores and John Williams is such a hero of mine you know i i was five when star wars first came out and remember that opening those opening credits and that score but i'm thinking of something like hedwig's theme in in harry potter that and how prevalent the harp is there for creating that magic it just must be it must have been such a privilege to hear that score played for the first time it when was we, we did it at air studios and and john williams is um uh, what i call old school so he does not um, like anybody to wear headphones because he thinks that you play differently if you've got headphones. So I was in the room. And if you can imagine the conductor in front of the orchestra um, and he's conducting everybody there, I was behind on the left. So basically all I had to see of his conducting was his left elbow. And he would not allow any of us to wear headphones. So if I had something to play with the Glock, which was about 100 yards away, I'd have to guess. And it was challenging beyond belief. And that Hedwig's theme, um, the, when the, the violins first played it, well, they had to rehearse it. I mean, marvellous, marvellous players, but they had to rehearse it. They had to practice it. And um, as you know, um, that there's a big harp solo called Fluffy's Harp in that first one, and uh, and and we did that um, we did that right at the end of the film, and um, it's just full of five finger runs and trills. Now I know Carol will go, oh my goodness, because that's the sort of thing that is the hardest thing to do because you only use four fingers and trilling isn't great with one hand, so. <laughs> So, you know, put all that into one harp solo and you know, now play sort of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, his music was just, I still love listening to that first Harry Potter movie. It's gorgeous. And, and this is a hard question to answer, I'm sure, but on average, how many sessions would a film of that, you know, that stature give you? Well, he, he, uh, he, he particularly likes to work in sort of blocks. So, now as he's a little older but i would say um in the in the um, older days um i would say probably um five to seven days right. morning and afternoon yeah. something like that. a normal film big film with a lot of music would take at least five days but of course it's all changed now because um after lockdown they've allowed the studios to open would you like me to tell you yes, the please do 
Well, um, we started recording in June and um, to a strict regime. So which meant that um, it didn't affect me so much because I'm still I, I'm locked up. I'm not locked down now. <laughs> I'm locked up. <laughs> I've been for years. <laughs> so they can only allow a certain section of the orchestra in the, in, in the room on one day. So we do the strings, which has to have a stand each, socially distant. So they've got probably about 40 different stands with 40 sets of parts spread out over the studio. And I'll be in the booth or the piano and the piano will be in the booth. So that's fine. And then after we've gone, they deep clean the studio. <laughs> and the next day the woodwind turn up. Mm. And so they're absolutely, you know, two to three meters apart all over the studio. And then when they finished, they clean the studio again. And we all have to wear masks when we're not playing or whether we're in the, in the actual body of the room. And uh, we're not allowed to get near to anybody. There's no catering or anything like that. And then after the woodwind, perhaps they'll have the brass session. And then the, the next day, they'll have the percussion. So instead of doing everything in about two to three days, it'll take four or five. Yeah, yeah. But having said that, we are working. Which is wonderful to hear. We had uh, our guest yesterday was Sophie Jeannin, the um, principal conductor of BBC Singers, who's working in Paris. And she was talking about how they are working again. And then Clara McFadden last night was talking about working in Amsterdam. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to hear that after being in such stringent lockdown that we are now emerging again. But I'm imagining that even though there might be a requirement for more sessions, budgets haven't doubled. So does no. that put even more pressure on you to get the work done in a fewer number of sessions? Yes. I mean, you know, we always have that idea that we have to, you know, be as quick as possible. Yeah, yeah. In um, any case. You know, there's no time for sort of pondering over things. No. Um, can I bring in Meg Davis now, who's put a question in the chat? Oh. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, I'm graduating from the college this year uh, in Woodwind Doubling. I was just wondering if, aside from being introduced by teachers, are there any other ways you would recommend to get an initial contact with the fixers in London? Uh, I don't think that um, that it actually is the teachers that introduce you to um, contractors. I think you have to send in your CV to anybody that you can get a name and address for and quote your, the fact that you've done this and quote your experiences. And, um, and then if an opportunity comes in, um, that some, you know, there, there's an, uh, someone needed at the last minute, because that's how we all started, you know. We always started by filling in for people who were either too busy or got sick. You know, so, so it was never a sort of straight road in, oh, I'll do this now. Uh, I, I'm afraid none of us have ever mm -hmm. done that. We've all gone baby steps at the beginning and filled in for when people are really um, uh, not available. And so I think write as many CVs and, and send them off and, and nice letters to fixers and stuff like that that you can. And um, if, if any of your teachers do uh, work in a certain area, all you can say to them is if you ever need somebody, perhaps you would recommend me at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's all you can do. And they will know yeah. how you play. And I mean, that's how I um, helped my own former students, because first of all, I know exactly what their abilities are. And, and how, how fast they are, and how good sight readers they are, and, all, and how reliable they are. You know, it's no good being brilliant if you don't turn up. Mm. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's a gradual thing, but uh, yes, send your CVs round. Okay, thank you. I'll use two words there, which I think are really underestimated in, uh, and we don't think of them enough perhaps, which you said nice, sending nice letters off, and reliable uh, and the important you know you've got such a gorgeous personality you're so lovely to work with um, that is a really important part of being a professional musician isn't it absolutely just as important as being able to play 
your cooperation and your, the way you are and the way you communicate with the people that you're working for. Because let's face it, they've been doing this project, uh, probably working on it for about, um, you know, up to a year, even more. And the, the recording is the culmination of all their work that they've done in a darkened room with orchestrators. And then they come out and they hear their music um, come to life. And the fact, the fact that you might be working five days a week on three different projects, it still means that when you see somebody with their first new project, they are waiting for you to deliver something really wonderful for them. So we can't get sort of, oh dear, you know, we're working every day this week, you know. You, you've just got to be um, what I call giving of yourself and um, making them feel special. Mark those words, all students, all of us in this room, so, so important. Um, Carol Thomas, head of Harp at Welsh College, has, has put a few questions in. and she, she was a little bit embarrassed, but I said, no, please ask them. So, Carol. Um, Skyler, lovely to see you, as usual. Um, you. I just have a couple of questions, which might be um, a little bit off the topic of... Um, recording and session work but I'm sure somebody hopefully will ask you about Elton John before the end of the session but um, I would like to just um, um, inquire about your actual composing because I know that you write quite a lot for the harp um, and also that you've written a new piece I think on um, inspired by climate change is that right? That's right. Um, so working with so many of these wonderful composers um, and their writing is obviously thematic. Um, was there one in particular that inspired you to write this piece, or is it a culmination of lots of ideas, or how did it start? It started by me writing a poem, and I wrote this narration um, on, on a, funnily enough, I worked on it, because uh, sometimes, you know, you can be sitting there and you're not in a lot of music, because the harp's not required so I always bring stuff to do and I and I had to, this piece to write and I thought where do I start and I, with me I I often use words to trigger what I want to write musically so I wrote this poem and um, it, it turned out a whole page of stuff and if you like I, I will read it to you if there is time please uh, would you like that love it yes okay well um so this is called um, Beyond the Clouds, an Ode to Climate Change. Long ago, the hills were calm and sunlight shone through broken clouds. Fresh breezes filled the clear blue sky with a warm, enhancing, graceful balm. We now repeat our daily lives in cars, boats, trains and planes, without a thought that what we do has caused our planet such great pain. But over time, the ice caps melt. Such river flows we have not felt. The ocean stirs, the wind it roars, the rains thrash down, for days it pours. Huge storms attack the land in rage. The damage caused we cannot gauge. The mountains heave, the lowlands sink. We push our planet to the brink. The factories spew out their evil smoke to fill the greed of Western folk. What can we do? Is it too late? Has destiny forged our predoomed fate? Perhaps through music, art, and science, we can secure our future in defiance of forces that seek to destroy the worth of the sacred beauty of Mother Earth. Man must now find the answers to change or not to change. That is the real question thank you for sharing that with us uh, i mean 
showing another another side yet of your you know incredible versatility and uh, and that inspired this piece that's yes i wrote the poem then i thought how am i going to describe this now so it was much easier because there's a calm section i i illustrated what i had written and of course the storm <laughs> the storm on the harp it's quite interesting because that's quite an ad lib section so when when people perhaps might get around to playing it at some point, they can really go crazy and make their own storm. <laughs> is it a solo harp? Yes. And is it going to be... And, and then in lockdown, I was going to add to this, um, I, I, I finished the piece and the, and the narration just as we were locking down. And the first thing I did in lockdown was I wanted to phone a few of my former students to ask them how they were doing. And I suddenly thought, having spoken to people in Hong Kong and China and Switzerland and etc., that perhaps I should ask some of my friends to translate the poem. And we have 11 versions of this poem. Brilliant. And um, I, I did a little interview for the Harp Channel a couple of weeks ago, and I played the piece. And... Um, and the, the lady uh, who host, hosted it, a um, very famous harpist called Jana Bushkova, she asked all her students from around the world to speak the poem in their native languages. And so it was really a globally embracing, most touching moment. I, I've never experienced that before. Carol, have we got it in Welsh yet? Well, Would I you about that <laughs> I should have prepared it shouldn't I <laughs> yeah. I will, I'll happily send you the poem Karen if you would yeah. translate of course I will Skylar of course so was it inspired by any particular um, collaboration or? no 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 I mean the thing is because I play so much um, of other people's music all the time when I come to doing my own I, I always feel that I want to sort of really enjoy playing the stuff that I've written and I don't give myself too many headaches, if you understand what I'm talking about. And uh, so I want it to be able to be idiomatically played, not too difficult. And also um, if people don't want to memorize it, to be able to turn the page and, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, so really um, it's just describing what I've written and, and um, that's really, it starts from nowhere and ends in nowhere. It's a big, what I call hairpin <laughs> of a piece. <laughs> uh, we're, we've come to over the hour, but Carol, you have to ask your last question. I'm dying to know the answer to this. <laughs> My question is, Skylar, I know that you're a keen baker. So <laughs> who's the most famous person you baked a cake for and what was it? Um, I'm not sh Oh, I tell you, I did bake a specific cake for uh, Peter Kosminski, who is a very famous director of, we did Wolf Hall for him on the television. And um, in the middle of this series, because I work a lot for uh, Debbie Wiseman, who's a, a lady composer, and uh, she'd written the music for this series. And she said, oh, uh, it's Peter's birthday on the next episode that we're recording. You know, um, she said, do you think you might making a cake? So not only do I have to bring the harp in and <laughs> all the furniture and other music, but I'm, I'm trying to juggle this cake and hide it as a surprise so that we all go into the control room and have it in the break, you know. <laughs> but um, that, that's taken a little bit of a backseat now, the baking, because, uh, you know, people were expecting me to actually turn up to every recording session with the cake. <laughs> And that got a little bit too much of a pressure. <laughs> What's your favourite cake to make? Oh, um, I suppose the children, the grandchildren, they like this sort of ch uh, chocolate tray bake stuff that's just divine. Sounds, sounds gorgeous. Oh, <laughs> Skylar, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for, for all your great questions. Um, it's, it's just been such a, a joy to spend an, an hour in your company. Um, at the end of every one of these sessions, I'm asking some quick fire questions. Um, and uh, I'll give a clue to one of them because uh, we discovered the most amazing photograph of you, which I shared with you on email. 
of you in an open top sports car with your harp wedged in the passenger seat outside the Royal Academy in the 1960s, looking impossibly glamorous. Um, uh, what car, was that your car? No, <laughs> that was the photographer's car. Oh, I see. I think he's a quite famous photographer. I've actually forgotten his name now, but Eric Auerbach, I think it was called. He oh, was called. Right. I think yeah. a very famous. And I don't know how this photo survived, obviously on his profile and on his website, but uh, his idea of a publicity photo was, you know, a little bit way off. Well, we, I, if you wouldn't, I think we should share it with our, with our <laughs> students because it just the most glamorous image. It's amazing. Okay, so here are these uh, five quick fire questions, if that's okay. So, session or performance? Session. Abbey Road or Air Lindhurst? 50 50, sorry. 50 50. Travel or home? Home. Estate car or sports car? Estate car. <laughs> Sweet or savoury? Sweet. <laughs> Skylar Kanga, huge thanks from all of us at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and a big round of applause to you all. Oh. To you. Thank you. Thank you. My great pleasure, Tim. Great pleasure. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.